Evening is about time to begin. If you'd like to get your soft books, be turned to the number 284. In just a few minutes, Jim will be leading our song worship this evening. Uh, it's good to see everyone. Again, tonight we have a great number of visitors with us, and some have come a great distance. Uh, I'm just no road one or a Lord night because I think it'd be a tie for everybody. But we're glad to have everyone here. I appreciate your uh, your attendance. Our, our visitors are our honored guests, and your great encouragement to us. We thank you so very much for taking time out of your busy schedule and coming to be a part of our gospel meeting. We're pleased to have Brother Reagan McQueenie uh, with us this week, and uh, we have had a virtual spiritual feast Amen. in the lessons that he has brought to us this week. Been richly blessed to delve into the Lord's work and see glimpses of glory that he's been showing us. We look forward to another good lesson tonight, and then tomorrow night will be the close of our meeting. Instead of at 7.30, we'll meet at 7 tomorrow evening. We hope that you'll be able to come out and be a part of that. Uh, Brother Roy Faust used to be able to stand before a group, and he was blind. And he would tell every visitor, he would name by name every visitor. I started to say we had visitors from, but I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna miss, I'm not even going to try that. But we've got visitors <laughs> from all over. We just appreciate it so very much. And we have visitors from right here in the community, and we want you to know how honored we are for you to be here. At the appropriate time, we're gonna ask Brother Paul Hammond, who works with the Lord's people in Graham, he would lead our first prayer. And then at the close of our service, we'll ask Brother David Riggs, who works with the Lord's people in Springtown, if he will dismiss us in prayer. We appreciate you being here. We invite everyone to join in our singing service at this time. <coughs> Good evening. Let's all turn to number 284. What will your answer be? <clears throat>
Our holy God, our Father in heaven, we're so thankful to you for this day, the blessings of life you've given us, and the opportunity you've given us to come here and to assemble, to praise your name, to hear your word proclaimed, to encourage each other, and build each other up in, in our fellowship and our faith. We pray that you would help us as we go to this worship, that it would be acceptable to you, that our hearts would be open, that we would glorify you, and that we would determine to glorify you tomorrow and every day as we leave this place. Pray that you would be with us as we listen to your word. We're glad today be with the speaker and be with us as listeners. We thank you so much, Father, that you have revealed your will through this word. We pray that you would help us to grow closer to you, to grow more faithful to you, that in your, in your name we would do all things in this life, that we'd be examples to this world, that we would be ready to give an answer, that we would be able to bring souls to you, and that we would be able to hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. These things we ask in your son's name. Amen. 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 Before Brother McClinney's lesson this evening, let's turn to number 297. 297, prepare to meet thy God. Let's be standing for this song, please. <laughs> This evening will be number 283. There's a great day coming. Brother Ray. Well, good evening. Uh, if you would like to take out your Bible, please, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 20. We'll begin reading in verse 9, Revelation chapter 20, as the rest of the lessons have come from the ending chapters of the book of Revelation. That will be our primary text tonight as well. Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 9. As we've been discussing the, these thoughts pertaining to heaven, uh, it's, 
it's kind of unusual to have a topic like this that, that almost everybody that we come in contact to, with in the world believes in to some degree or another. According to polling data, most Americans believe in heaven. About 72% across all religious and non-religious backgrounds believe in a place, quote, where people who have led good lives are eternally rewarded. But you might be surprised to learn that most Americans, almost 60%, believe in hell, too, a place where, quote, people who have led bad lives and die without being sorry are eternally punished. I don't know about you, but I would have supposed that there would have been a bigger gap between those two things, that, that lots and lots of people would believe in heaven and very few people would believe in hell. But, you know, deep down, we probably all know to believe in one is to believe in the other. I, I hope over the course of these lessons that we are better equipped to, to answer that question of what heaven will be like. We have discussed these glimpses of glory as the inspired writers have given us glimpses, images, so that the eyes of our hearts, the eyes of our understanding might be enlightened and we might see just a little better, not through physical, literal descriptions, but through images that provide us these positive associations, what heaven is going to be like. And that we might be more motivated to want to go to heaven. And so we've talked about the grace of God. We've talked about seeing God. We've talked about these images of heaven, of this, this wonderful, beauty, beautiful, holy city. We've talked about it being the bride of Christ, adorned for her husband, and all of the purity that, that comes with that. And last night we talked about the paradise of God. Somebody came up to me afterwards and said uh, uh, their husband never really liked cities, so he was happy to hear uh, that, that country people could look forward to heaven as well, right? And so if you're visiting with us tonight, we are so glad that you're here. Uh, and I would really encourage you to think about these things deeply. To imagine and think about heaven as it's described and be motivated to want to go there. And I want you to know that's what we've been preaching about all week. But what is hell like? You know, just like heaven, we don't actually know in a literal, physical sense. But the images are clear and sobering. And I think in some ways, it's almost easier to imagine hell. Um, I've asked you to participate a number of times in this, so here's what I want you to do. If you think it's easier to imagine heaven, give me a one. If you think it's easier to imagine hell, give me a two. So heaven or hell, which is easier for you to imagine? Okay, and somebody did this. That's good. I can imagine both. I can imagine both too. That's good. Um, you know, for me, I, I think hell is maybe just a little bit easier to imagine. And maybe there's some applications to be made there about this place in which we live. And maybe we shouldn't hold on to it quite as tightly if we can imagine the place of punishment so well. But I think it does take a far less vivid imagination to picture hell and to picture it clearly. The image of hell is in some ways clearer than heaven. And, and I like the ratio of these lessons that we've done three lessons specifically on heaven and these images of heaven. And we're just going to have one lesson on hell but may I suggest that this one lesson is still necessary and it's still important because God has given us this image right alongside those images of heaven. Oh, I don't know, it was maybe a couple of years ago, I was, I was about to preach on hell uh, back home at Timberland Drive where I preach regularly. And, and just like here, we've got song leaders who like to lead songs that go along with the lesson. And so the song leader texted me and said, oh, what are you going to be preaching on tomorrow? And, and I wrote him back and said in a text message, I'm going to be preaching on hell. And he wrote back one word, yikes. <laughs> uh, and Jim did about as good a job as I've ever seen of picking out songs that fit with the lesson tonight. But, you know, we don't have a lot of songs about hell, do we? And, and what would those songs even sound like, you know? Aren't we all so glad we're not going to hell? <laughs> because it is kind of sobering to think about. It's not something that we enjoy thinking about. And I've told some of you, I really enjoy preaching. I love preaching, but I don't really love preaching this lesson. 
But God in his wisdom thought it necessary to tell us and describe to us the place of punishment. And so it is necessary for us to consider that. We need to be reminded, even in the midst of all of these glimpses of glory, that hell is the alternative. And so if you're there in the book of Revelation, read with me, beginning in Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 9. This is one of the best pictures we have of what this place of punishment is going to be like. And again, let's not take, think about these things in literal physical terms, but again, these are images that gives us associations so that we might understand the concepts behind this spiritual place. So let's begin reading in verse 9, Revelation chapter 20. And they went on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil, who deceived them, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. And I think the image there is that each of us have a book, and in that book is written the deeds of our life. And those books are opened and the deeds of our life are revealed. And there's another book there where the, the saints, those who belong to the Lamb, are written in his book of life. And all of these books are opened and God, the righteous judge, judges us based on the deeds, the things that we have done in the body, and based on our association or not with the Lamb. And so in verse 3, or 13, excuse me, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead that were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Drop down to, if you would, to chapter 21 and verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And I think we get further insight into what heaven is like by the negative description of heaven itself. If you go back to chapter 21 and verse 4 in describing this holy city, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Heaven is a place without these things that are described there in verse 4. It is a place where there is no more death or sorrow or crying. Hell is a place without relief from these things. Isn't that the way it is described? Heaven says there's no sorrow or tears or crying. How is this place of punishment described? It is a place of wailing and gnashing of teeth. Heaven is described as a place where there is no more death. And yet hell is called the second death. Death personified is cast into the lake of fire along with the unrighteous. Heaven is a place where there is no more pain. And yet in hell it says that they will be in torments forever and ever. And as we have had in this, in our mind, this picture of what heaven is like, in many ways hell is just the opposite of that picture of glory. As hell is described, it is the antithesis of of heaven. And you remember all of these terms that we used for heaven, uh, especially from the book of Psalms, as this, how this heavenly city was described. It is a place of breathtaking beauty, refuge and safety, total peace, priceless value, justice and righteousness, perfect purity and holiness, prosperity and abundance, joy, perfect fellowship with God and man, where we really truly belong. A place of healing and rest and escape from hardship and satisfaction. You want to know what the place of punishment is like, you take every one of those descriptions 
and just flip it around. What is hell like? It is a place of ugliness and uncertainty and conflict. It is a place of cheapness with no justice or righteousness, only sin. What is the opposite of those things? That's, that's hell. Uh, there's a, a preacher that I've, I've looked up to through the years. He's passed just in the last couple of years by the name of Dee Bowman. Many of you have probably heard of Dee. And, and he's got a saying that he says has said, and I've heard him say it live a couple of times as he was talking about heaven. He says, if you miss heaven, you've just missed all there is. And that's beautiful. Isn't it? Everything that is worthwhile, everything that is beautiful, everything that is fulfilling and good is found in heaven. I'm also pretty good friends with uh, Dee's son, Russ, who's also a preacher. But instead of being as positive as Dee was, uh, Russ is more of a cynic. And he would say that to him. He would say that himself. Uh, I think he's actually preached here at this congregation. Russ has on a number of occasions. And a number of years ago, Dee and his son Russ were preaching in a lectureship up in the Metroplex. And uh, the way it was arranged, Russ was going to be preaching a lesson on hell, and then his dad, Dee, was going to follow him up and preach a lesson on heaven. And so Russ gets up to begin his lesson on hell, and he says uh, something along these lines. He says, uh, now my dad is going to get up here in just a second and say what he always says. If you miss heaven, you've just missed all your there is. But I'm here to tell you this evening, if you miss heaven, hell is all there is. Well, maybe that's the cynical way of looking at it. But there's some truth to that, isn't it? Everything that we want, everything that we desire, everything that is good is found in heaven. And if we miss heaven, it is only the dregs of the things that we don't want that are left. Hell is in the spiritual realm, of course, but have you ever thought about how hell is described using our five physical senses? I think God did that because these are things that we can understand. These are things we can associate with. Have you ever noticed this? Think about your senses. Isn't hell described in terms of sight? Well, in terms of lack of sight, in terms of darkness and blindness, it is described as a place of total outer darkness. It is the deepest, darkest, bottomless pit. Uh, when I was 10 years old, we went to Carlsbad Caverns, um, and uh, I don't know if you've ever been there in New Mexico, but they, they walked us down through these caverns, and it's really a, incredible, uh, amazing. But there's one place, there's one pit there that is described as the bottomless pit. And as a 10-year-old, nobody thought to tell me that it wasn't really bottomless. Um, and so I looked down in that thing, and there was a tour guide there, a park ranger, and he shined this really super bright, bright flashlight down into this darkness, and you couldn't see anything. I mean, the light just kind of evaporated, and then he threw a little pebble, and it fell, and it fell, and it fell, and you never heard it hit the bottom. Well, in actuality, there is a bottom to this. It's just so far down, you can't see it or can't hear it. But how is hell described? It is described as the bottomless pit. The people of God were often thrown into pits in the Bible. Joseph and Jeremiah and Daniel, even Jesus himself was believed to be thrown in a pit on the night in which he was betrayed. But they could all be brought out of that pit. But not this pit. This pit is bottomless. There is no rescue. You fall and you fall and you fall never to come out again. But perhaps the worst part of darkness is the isolation, that you're all alone there without anyone to help or anyone to guide you. You're there without God. And what is it that makes hell so bad? Well, it's the opposite of what makes heaven so good. Heaven is what it is because God is there and hell is what it is because God isn't there. We talked on Sunday morning in the Bible class how the Lord is at hand, how he is always near and his presence is always around us. And yet there is one place that we go where he says, I have removed my presence from you. And it is this place of punishment. 
I think about Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 11 and describing the Gentiles without God. It says, having no hope and without God in this world. Uh, one of the paraphrases says, without God and without hope in this world. And yet, even in this world, there is still opportunity. There is the chance to come to know God. But in hell, that opportunity is lost forever. Of course, some people say, well, you're not actually alone because the devil and his angels and the demons are there. And, and sometimes I think we imagine the devil kind of reigning in hell. And we've got all of these uh, cartoon strips even, right, that show the devil and he's doing these things to punish people in hell. Uh, even in classical literature, uh, in classical Christian literature, you think about Paradise Lost, remember Milton, and he wrote that uh, demonic devil character in his book, uh, he said, I'm trying to get the quote right, I think he said, uh, better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. But is that really what the devil is doing there? The devil and his angels are being punished right along with everybody else. The devil can't rule because he's too busy being punished. They have their own problems to worry about. And so hell itself is this place of isolation where we are always and truly alone in our own anguish. And so we see this idea of sight, but we also see the idea of smell, right? You say, smell, wait a second. What does hell smell like, at least as it's described in the Bible? It is a place of fire and what? Brimstone. brimstone. What do we call brimstone today? Sulfur, right? Sulfur. And sulfur itself doesn't really have a smell until it starts to burn. And then it smells like rotten eggs, right? Have you ever smelled that? Uh, that was what was in those old stink bombs that we used to have, right? And they just smelled the place up. They had a little bit of sulfur in there. When I was uh, growing up, I went to camp up in Colorado and uh, beautiful, beautiful camp um, just up from Pagosa Springs, Colorado. Uh, and they had spring water there that was, that was lovely. Uh, but if it was uh, during a drought, we'd have to switch off the spring water and go to the well water. And the well water was sulfur water. And everybody just stunk the whole week, right? It was in your hair and on your skin and in your clothes. Well, that's the smell. That's the association that the Bible wants us to have with this place. That's what it smells like. And what are you going to be hearing? Or what's the image of what we might hear in hell? Well, it's a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Is the place where people are in agony. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard somebody wail. Ever, ever heard somebody who's in so much pain that they are gnashing their teeth. But it is a sound that, that sticks with you. Uh, I, I heard it in the hospital one time. In a room over from the place where I was visiting, there was somebody in such great pain that they were wailing at the top of their lungs. And it was almost as if the entire floor was abandoned. Because nobody wanted to hear the sound of it. What about taste? Do we taste anything? Is, is there a description of taste? What's the description of taste? It's that dry mouth, that cotton mouth, where you can't get any saliva, where you're parched and dry and thirsty and it's hard to swallow. What's the thirstiest you've ever been in your life? Can you, can you think of that time? I, I know there's probably some people in here who've been more thirsty than me, but I think the thirstiest I've ever been in my life, I told you we went to camp in Colorado. That was always the first week of August, which meant once I got to high school, I missed the first few days of two-a-day practices for football. <laughs> and so there was some punishment involved with that. We were always able to work it out with the coach. But um, So I would go to the normal two-a-day practices for a week. The week after I got back for five days, I would go to the normal two-a-day practices. And you know, it's West Texas. It's 100 and whatever degrees, second week of August. And back then, you know, coaches thought water made you weak. And so you didn't have a bunch of water breaks. You got water at the beginning of practice. You got maybe one water break in the middle of practice. And then you got water at the end of practice, except for those people who had to run extra, like me, for getting in trouble. We had to skip that water, and we went over next door to the football field. There was a giant pea patch full of sand. And a coach would take us out there in our full black pads, black jerseys, black pants, black helmet. It's just an oven on your head. 
And what he would do is he would have us run forward until he blew the whistle and then we had to backpedal. And then he'd have us run forward again when he blew the whistle. And then he blew the whistle again and we backpedaled. And we had to go all the way up that pea patch, maybe 300, 400 yards, turn around and come back with him blowing that whistle, making us go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The best water I've ever had in my life was water that had been sitting out in the sun for four hours in those clear Gatorade bottles, stale and hot, and it was wet. <laughs> An oasis in the desert. That's the thirstiest I've ever been. Can you imagine that from now on or forever? That's the image. What about touch? The burning and unrelenting pain of a lake of fire burning with brimstone. You can't get it off of you. I think that's the image of the lake. It is like being drenched in gasoline and then thrown into something that is burning. And yet these are physical descriptions. We understand that. I'm not sure if we're going to have a body in hell. I'm just not sure about those sorts of things. And so I think the reality is that we will be conscious there. And so really, when we think about torments in hell, this torment is not really physical, it's, it's mental. Depression, crippling anxiety, paranoia, phobias, all of those things are just glimpses of that kind of torment. It is a place of torment, day and night, forever and ever. And in fact, the only two things that heaven and hell really have in common, at least as they're described in the book of Revelation, is their capacity, as many as people as want to go there will go there, and their permanency, that this is forever and ever. That same phrase is used of both places. And as many people as are in heaven, even more, perhaps, are in hell. That's what the scripture indicates. Turn to Matthew chapter 7, if you would. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, and begin reading with me in verse 13, if you would. Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Well, the question we ask appropriately is, how few is few? And I don't have a number for you on that, but uh, I, I do know that there will be fewer who go on this narrow way than there are the many who go on the broad way. And in comparison to those in hell, that great city that is big enough for anybody who wants to come that we've described over the last few days, that city is only filled with few. And this is permanent, eternal. I think the reality is we can endure just about anything if we know it's only for a little while. Uh, there was a, a semester um, when I was going to grad school full time and working full time and preaching full-time all at the same time. I had a lot of other things on my plate, and I called my dad up one time, and, and I said, Dad, I, I just don't know. I don't know if I can keep doing all of this at the same time. You know, I'm working 70, 80-hour weeks, and it's just I'm not getting enough sleep and all these things. He said, Reagan, you can do anything for a year. You can stand on your head for a year if that's what you have to do. And, and there's some truth to that, that we can endure anything for a season. We can endure anything for a little while. I think, in fact, much of our behavior as Christians is predicated on that fact, right? That this is not going to last forever. Our physical afflictions are but for a moment. But in hell, that's turned on its head. This is eternal. There is no relief. There is no break. And maybe more, worst of all, there is no hope that this is the way it is and there is no reprieve. It is just too late. I want you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. Some of the most sobering Verses in all the Bible for an assembly such as this. Second Peter chapter 2. Because when I look out at this audience, what I see, uh, as far as I know, primarily, we're talking about Christians, right? And yet in writing to Christians, Peter says this. In, in 2 Peter, let's look in chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, 
And in verse 6, he's talking about these false teachers who have come in and, and the doom on those who turn away from the Lord. And he says in verse 6, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, chapter 2 and verse 6, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. This is an example of God's punishment, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and their destruction. And so application is made if we keep going down to verse 18. Read with me beginning in verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, these false teachers do, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. They're alluring those who are already Christians, who know the right way. Verse 19. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now we got a bunch of ag people in the audience tonight. We understand that image of a sow returning to her wallowing in the mire. Uh, my cousins always showed pigs at the county show growing up and they would doll them up, they'd clean them up, they'd put glitter on them and a bow on their tail and all this stuff to show them. And as soon as the show was over, what does that pig do? It goes right back to the mud and the muck and the mire. And for the Christian who goes back into a life of sin, that's what it describes. But did you see that, that little point that he makes that the latter end is worse for them than the beginning? It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from it? Is he saying that hell is going to be worse for those people who became Christians and turned away than for those who never knew? You know, there are some people who, who have this idea that hell has these levels depending on how bad you are and you go down and down further and further. I don't think that's at all what he's talking about. I, I think this is what he's talking about. That for the rest of eternity, those people have to know, I had it. It was within my grasp. I tasted that the Lord was gracious. I knew the way of truth. I had the hope of heaven. And I chose to turn away from that. To know that reality. What a terrible, <laughs> terrible thought. I think there's nothing worse than knowing you can't fix something. I'm a dad. I'm pretty handy. I fix things. And, and we've told my girls that from, from the time they were a little bitty. Look, if something happens, don't hide it from us. Bring it to us. Whatever it is, we can work together to fix it. And yet there are some things that you just can't fix it because it's too late. A few weeks ago, Stephanie and I and some friends of ours were coming back from a, a double date and I was driving down the highway of 70 miles an hour, uh, four lane with the median. And so we're going straight down this highway and it's dark, right kind of dusky. It's kind of hard to see. Uh, and there was this dog running down the highway in the middle of the lane straight toward us. He was big and bad until Stephanie's Suburban hit him. And I've always kind of had a tender heart. I gave up hunting when I was 19 years old because I just, I hate killing things. Love shooting, hate killing. And there's such finality to that. It's nothing I can do about it. Can't fix it. And I think that's the reality, the reality of, of folks who find themselves in hell. But if you're here tonight, it's not too late. It's not too late to avoid all of that. 
We have the opportunity now to see that this isn't our faith. And in chapter 3 of 2 Peter, Peter describes the coming day of the Lord. And yes, there will be those who willfully forget that the Lord judged the world before and that he can judge the world again. That he is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, verse 9, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is not... Oh, I can't wait to punish these people. That is the last thing that God wants to do. And yet in his justice, he must. He has given us this choice and God wants us to choose him. And so we keep reading verses 10 through 13 of 2 Peter chapter 3. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all of these things, these physical things, will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? What kind of people must we be knowing this day is coming? Nevertheless, we, as Christians who know the Lord, According to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwell. We look to those glimpses of glory, knowing that if we're on the Lord's side, we're going to win. But we must be on his side. So what's the application of all of these things? Well, consider, what does seeing the image of hell do for us? Number one, it helps us to see God for who he really is. It keeps us from redefining what God can do and redefining who we want him to be. The devil is always casting God and himself in an incorrect light. That's what he did from the very beginning in his temptation of Adam and Eve. He is always denying God's promises and God's warnings. He is questioning God's motivations. And all the while, the devil is acting like he's the one on our side, that he's our friend. And he's done that from the very beginning. He mischaracterizes our place in relation to God. He says, you know what? He discourages us and said, you know, you're not really good enough to go to heaven. But then he whispers in the other ear and says, well, you're not really bad enough to go to hell either. And that just leaves us totally apathetic to either. And maybe that's part of the appeal of a doctrine like premillennialism. Well, everybody gets a second chance after the rapture. Or, or a doctrine like purgatory, that you have a second chance after, after death where you can work out these things and have another chance at heaven. I get another chance even after death. And the devil says that God's warnings are empty threats, that God's promises are empty hopes. And at the same time, the devil says he's not so bad, he's on our side, but none of it is true. Will you turn to Luke chapter 12 with me? Luke chapter 12. Sobering verses. Luke, Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 4. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do to you. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Who is Jesus talking about? Not the devil. He's talking about God. That we need to have a fear and reverence and respect for God himself because he is the judge. And the question people ask is, how can a good God send people to hell? And may I humbly suggest that that goes all the way back to our lesson on Saturday night. If we ask that question in sincerity, then we don't appreciate God's grace enough. If we ask, how could God possibly send people to hell? We do not appreciate the size of the gift that he is offering to us enough. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 describes this in better terms than I could. The Hebrew writer is admonishing these Jewish brethren, don't turn back, don't give up, don't lose heart. 
Don't let go of the assurance that you have in Jesus Christ. And in Hebrews uh, chapter 10, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26, he says this, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. I know what's right. I have a knowledge of the truth. I know this is wrong. I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. That's the kind of sin that's being described here. If we do that, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Don't think something else is going to save you besides the blood of Jesus. What's replaced in verse 27, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses of how much worse punishment do you suppose? He's asking you. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? kicked dirt on the blood of Jesus and said, I don't need the blood of your son. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Why did God do everything that he did? Because he loves us. Have you ever thought about what does God get out of all this? Why did God, knowing in his foreknowledge, knowing we're going to sin, knowing that some people were going to have to go to hell, why did he do it? Why did he allow it to happen? Have you ever thought about what does God get out of all of this? He gets us. He did it so that there might be his people who love him there is something so special about this relationship that we can and do have with him, both now and eternally, that God said, yes, I am willing. Because that's how special it is. God wants us to love him. That's the point of all of this. But he will absolutely scare people into doing what's right if that's what it takes. He will show his awesome power and might and the consequences of denying his will, which leads people to repentance and righteous action. Sometimes that is exactly what he does. And our modern world has tried to change God into this grandfatherly figure. Anybody in here, when your parents now suddenly are grandparents to your children, are they totally different people? I mean, that's the way it is with my parents, right? Who are you people, you know? They're like, oh, we, you know, ushering the girls into another room where they don't get in trouble, all these sorts of things. I'm like, are you the same people? What's going on? And I think sometimes that that's the image everybody wants to have for God, that he just ushers us onto his knees like, oh, they're there. I, I know that you've turned your back on me all this time, but just don't worry about it. Now, don't misunderstand me. God is always willing to forgive. That's what he desires. That's why he's done all of this. But God is righteous and just. He is a perfectly righteous and holy God. And we think about those examples where God showed his power and people feared him to do what was right. Job and Lot and Moses and Jacob and Jonah and Peter and Saul of Tarsus. Why? Because obedience, even primarily motivated by fear, is still far better than disobedience. And a God who is just, who has provided the way for us to be justified by sending his son, absolutely has the right to send someone to hell. He has that right as the righteous judge. And should that not, if we see God for who he really is, motivate us to righteousness? May I ask you a very personal question? This whole lesson's been a little bit uncomfortable, so let's make it worse. <laughs> Why did you become a Christian? Do you remember? I remember it vividly. Teenage Reagan 
was laying in bed one night. And I've played this little game in my head pretty often. Worst case scenario. Have you ever thought about that? What's the worst that could happen right now? I'm not a worrier at all. Usually I'd play that and figure out in inventive ways for me to get out of it, right? And so I thought to myself, what's the worst thing that could happen right now? Well, somebody could break into the house. And what would I do? I got a baseball bat in the closet, you know? Uh, if he came into my room, would I, would I fight? Would I hide? Would I go out the window? What would I do? What if he came into my room? What if he killed me looking for stuff? In that moment, I knew. Well, I'd go to hell. Because I've sinned against God and against others. I hadn't made it right. I hadn't come in submission, repent of my sins. I hadn't been baptized into Christ. I'd go to hell. And it motivated me to act and act right away without delay. The baptistry was broken. I didn't care. We went down White River Lake, took care of it. And all those fears were washed away. Did I love God? You bet I loved God. Did I want to please God? You bet I wanted to please God. But in that moment, what pushed me over the edge was fear and respect for a holy and righteous God who had the right to judge me because I knew my sin. It should motivate us to righteousness. Do I have stronger motivators now? I hope so, of course, but it's not like this one no longer counts. I don't want to go to hell and neither should you. And there are times when, yes, I love God and I love my neighbor, but I'm selfish and I'm sinful and what keeps me from doing what is wrong is, I don't want to go to hell and I don't want them to either. And if you're not a Christian, if you haven't submitted yourself totally to Jesus, yes, you should fear this. And if it motivates you to righteousness, praise God that it does. Amen. Seeing the image of hell helps us to hold our tongue too. Do we want God to damn someone? Do we really want that? Are we going to tell someone to go to hell? Are we going to use it as an exclamation? No, not really. Not if we know what hell is. I don't want that. I don't want that for anyone. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. Surely that helps us to hold our tongue if we see this image for what it is. Seeing this image for what it is motivates us to be godly parents and grandparents. I don't even like talking about this, but I've got those two precious little girls and those girls can be lost. Yeah, I even, I even use that kind of language here because I don't want to say explicitly those girls could go to hell. And there may be no one else in this whole world who has more influence on whether or not that happens than their mother and me. Now, don't misunderstand me. They have to make up their own minds and make their own decisions when that time comes. But I could be part of the reason that they don't go to heaven. My indifference, my apathy, my lack of faith, my misplaced priorities, it could be partially my fault. And when I realized that, all of a sudden that report card or that, that ball game or that spring formal dance or their popularity with their peers, all of those things just don't mean as much anymore. My charge as a parent is to bring them up in the, in the discipline and instruction of the Lord to the very best of my abilities. And don't get that twisted. I didn't have perfect parents, and I'm certainly not a perfect parent. So you know how many times I've had to apologize to that 9-year-old and 12-year-old for something that I did. And yet they know that what is most important to their dad is their spiritual condition. I would die for either one of those girls in a moment without a thought. But I would rather them be taken from me in this life than to lose them eternally. I'm a steward, nothing more. They've been entrusted to my care, and as God is my witness, I will do everything within my power to pave the way for them to go to heaven.
I don't think it's too strong to say, I'm, I'm going to heaven. I have that confidence. First John tells me I should. And I believe Stephanie's going to heaven, but whether or not Madison and Brooklyn are is still very much undecided. And like it or not, whether it ought to be that way or not, whether it just shows immaturity in me or not, it makes me a better father to know that and to remember that. And then finally, in conclusion, shouldn't this image of hell motivate us to evangelism? It ought to, right? I mean, I'm not the judge. Neither are you. No man, no woman is in the position to judge the eternal destiny of another. That is reserved for God alone. Only God will make that determination and he will make it perfectly. But if I hold up the mirror of the word of God against someone's life and in that comparison, I have the fear that, that they're not doing what is right, that they are not right with God, the decent thing, the loving thing is to try and help them off of the path that they're on and onto the path that leads to life. You know what? I can almost guarantee that, that when I said it motivates us to evangelism, when I talked about holding up that mirror of God's word, there is probably somebody in your life whose face, whose face came to mind. And we should ask ourselves, what can I do? What can I do? What small thing can I do to be an instrument for that perfect gospel, that perfect will of God to help that person? What can you do even this week, even tomorrow, even tonight to help someone toward that path? Do you believe in help? I told you at the beginning of the week, I need to hear your head rattle this way or that way. Do you believe in help? They probably do too. And we have the power, not through ourselves, but through the gospel, to help each other avoid that place and to have the hope of eternal life in the other. This lesson is not as important as the others. And it is just as essential to remember and to see. God has prepared a place for us. That's the place I want to go to. And I want to spend the rest of my life not having to worry about this other place where I might go. <laughs> because I know through the blood of Jesus that I am saved. And that I am doing my best to live my life in submission to his will. And when I do things that are wrong, I seek to make things right. I confess and I repent. And as 1 John 1 and 2 tells us, the blood of Jesus can cleanse us of all sin and all unrighteousness. If you're here this evening and you're not yet a Christian, if you've not yet come to God, now is the time. God is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness. He is long-suffering. He has been long-suffering. And he has waited till now. But we are not promised a moment longer. Won't you make your life right with God? And if you're a Christian and you've not been living the way you ought to live, make that right even this evening. And Jesus promises to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. We can help you in any way tonight. Won't you come now? But together we stand. There's a great day coming, a great day coming. There's a great day coming by and by. When the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left. Are you ready for that day to come?
sobering lesson this evening and as he said it's a necessary lesson even though sometimes our pew got a little warm while he was talking about these things a little uncomfortable like we said last night this church exists to help people go to heaven and the reason that we do this is because we don't want anybody to go to heaven and as I've said before if tonight you have those thoughts that Reagan kind of thought about when he went, was baptized. And you have those in your bed at night. You don't have to wait till tomorrow night to, to obey the gospel and respond to the invitation. We'd be glad to help you at any time. All you have to do is call us. All you have to do is let us know. We'd be glad to help you at any time, day or night. There's several people in this auditorium right now who know that's exactly the truth. So if we can help you, please, let us know. Don't wait too long. Because there'll be a time when you can't do that. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate all those who are visitors who have come, especially those who have traveled so far. And those who are here from the community, we want you to know you're our honored guest. And we hope that you'll come back again. We'll meet again tomorrow night at 7 p.m. That will be the last sermon in this meeting and uh, last series of studies we invite you and if you're able to come can be a part of that as well we'll be led in our closing prayer at this time by David I need to say amen to what buddy said yeah. let's pray please Father we thank you so much for letting us be here tonight to hear this good young man speak these words to us Help us to realize what's going on in this world, Father, that if there is a heaven, there is a hell, there is a God, there is a Satan. And we need to recognize that and do what we can to love our glorify our God and Father and go to heaven. We pray, Father, for each one of us in this congregation and each person in this building tonight. We know that we all have things going on in our lives. Satan is using to drag, drag us down and pull us away from the truth, Father. Help us to seek you to overcome those things to do the things we know that will help us make it to heaven father because that's where we we don't want to go there we miss the road father we thank you for the christians throughout the world who are striving to do your will give them strength and courage regardless of the things that are going on around them whether it be trials tribulations persecutions illnesses whatever it might be father we know you'll help them help us to pray for them remember them father we pray for our country that things will will not change and will cause it to be harder for us to worship you. We pray, Father, that if it does, we will have the courage to continue doing the things we need to be doing. Be with each person here, Father, as they leave this building tonight and go their way, that you'll give them a safe journey back to their homes and their families and their congregations if they're Christians. If they're not Christians, Father, we pray that as they think about the things that we're seeing, they will touch their hearts and that they will make a decision to do it. Is right according to your will and give yourselves to you and the sin is washed away, Father. Guide us in all that we do. Bless us in everything as you see fit. We thank you so much for your son who gave his life for us, Father. Let us always glorify that in all that we do. In his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.